I realize that most of my coverage of this viral outbreak so far has essentially been a central banker YouTube reaction video. Today we're shifting gears as it's no longer the Federal Reserve in the driver's seat. Enter new chief stimulator Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, seen here posing with the love of his life, and his wife made it in the picture too. Now I want to emphasize what we're talking about today is completely unrelated to everything the Federal Reserve is currently doing. Although don't worry it's just as expensive. Steve Mnuchin is asking Congress for $850 billion in viral stimulus. Over the next few weeks that I spend unable to leave my apartment in Corona Heights, Queens, let's hope there's no foreshadowing there, I'm going to be breaking down the various aspects of the federal government's stimulus plans, starting with industrial bailouts. Now you've probably heard the debates about whether to bail out the airline industry, but right now it's like America just won the lottery. We're getting calls from all sorts of distant cousins who are having money troubles. Yeah, it's your friends over in the oil industry. We heard you were handing out money and not sure if you remember last week, but Saudi Arabia plummeted oil prices. Money please? It'll really annoy the liberals if that'll do anything to move the needle. How are you doing, kiddo? It's your degenerate gambling addicted uncle over in the casino industry. I heard you were handing out some cash. Why don't you slide some chips our way? Turns out the house lost this hand. Can't imagine Trump would have any sympathy for failing casinos. And of course, you have to put those failing casinos on hold because your aunt who likes to have a little too much fun is calling you from a cruise ship. Because boy, she could use a loan as well. The list goes on and on as industry lobbyists try to come up with a lifetime movie interpretation of their future prospects. The question now becomes, who do we help and how? According to a Washington Post source briefed on internal White House deliberations who is not authorized to speak to reporters, ooh, little bit of a rule breaker there, every industry is affected, every restaurant is affected. How are you going to draw the line between who gets government aid and who doesn't? It becomes a real corporate welfare scramble. We're still in the heat of that scramble though, so if my coverage sounds incredibly vague at some points, it's because tomorrow a tweet could change literally everything. What I can do is give you a rough idea of what this will look like by breaking down the airline bailout, which is the bailout we have the clearest understanding of as of this point and compare that to the 2008 automobile bailout. So first, let's take a business class in business class and talk about the airline industry and bailout. Uh, continuing that conversation about the U.S. airlines, they are seeking a rescue package of more than $50 billion from the government. Again, take some of this next part with a grain of salt, as when I googled airlines for America bailout PDF, the top three results were different reputable sources saying that the airline industry was asking for $54 billion, $45 billion, or $60 billion. Things are moving really fast right now and a lot is changing. What I'm getting at is, everything you've seen so far, well that's established. But for the next bit of this episode, it's true as of me clicking the publish button. So with that warning, let's get into what the airline industry bailout might actually look like. Their bailout request is broken up into three sections, immediate assistance in the form of grants, longer term liquidity measures as in the form of loans, and tax relief. Now that might sound mundane, but there are huge differences between these funding vehicles. First, American Airlines are asking for $29 billion worth of grants. Now this is just cash. You don't have to pay it back, just, you know, don't fire anyone and keep up the good work. Second, we come to loans. These are, well, loans. We'll give you the money, but we want something in return. Thoughtfully enough, the airline industry gave us several different loan options, but unfortunately none of them in the emergency exit row. The first idea would see the Federal Reserve buying $29 billion worth of airline stocks. This would give airlines $29 billion in liquidity and America $29 billion worth of their stocks. Hey, with this run on toilet paper, those could be helpful. 
Not for nothing, airlines got into this mess because they wasted pretty much all of their profits on stock buybacks. That could be us, guys. Now, if you're not into that option, well, they ought also have a $29 billion zero interest loan proposal. Oh, how generous, you guys. Really putting some skin in the game with that one. Or if that doesn't wet your beak, well, then they'll give us a third option of a $25 billion loan guarantee on zero interest. This is essentially America co-signing on a loan to the airline industry from the banks. Hey, if they can't afford to pay it, we'll cover for them. Good news though, the Federal Reserve just lowered interest rates to 0% across the board. So I guess we just figured out who wins with that decision. So that's the loan section. Now to the final section, tax relief. They want a rebate for the taxes airlines have to pay towards an airport and runway maintenance fund and a future repeal of such maintenance taxes until 2021. This would free up about $15 billion a year. Although, why shudder to imagine what LaGuardia would be like with even less money. Between the tax rebate and the tax cut, that's an additional $45 billion. But it's coming from airports and not the federal government. So when? That's what the airlines are asking for right now. Remind me again who's doing who a favor in this situation? Now I imagine the White House is being inundated with similar requests from every industry under the sun. For their part, the White House is pushing for $50 billion in airline bailout funds. And that number seems to receive bipartisan support in Congress. But as of now, we have no idea where the planned cuts to get the requested amount down to $50 billion are going to come from. Let's hope it's out of the $29 billion grant part though, right? Come on, don't just give them free money. So is this a good deal? Well, what did we do back in the automobile bailout era? Mr. Bush said allowing the US auto industry to fail would be devastating to working Americans. It would worsen a weak job market and exacerbate the financial crisis. It could send our suffering economy into a deeper and longer recession. We're re-entering the undisputed reality section of this video. The facts from 2008 will not change in the next hour. In the most basic cost terms, the government spent $80 billion in that bailout and lost $10 billion. That's because the bailout consisted of the government buying corporate stocks and making loans rather than handing out cash with no strings attached. The bailout started with the government buying $25 billion of GM, Chrysler, and GMAC assets through the TARP program. During that same period, the Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson also approved $5 billion in loans to automobile suppliers. Then we sat back as a country and said, well, that's all the funds of the big three automakers said they needed. Crisis averted. Huh, that was almost too easy. After idling for months, General Motors now has flat tires and a dead battery. But Barack Obama's ready to hop in the driver's seat with a $30 billion jump start. The question is, will it spark GM's engine back to life? Or has there been too much wear and tear already? Wait, what? Yup, it was not crisis averted, as GM continued to sputter and now they were declaring bankruptcy on government loans. The initial $18.4 billion bailout was not enough. In April, GM borrowed another $2 billion. On May 2, 2009, GM stock fell below $1 a share for the first time since the Great Depression. That forced it to require another $4.4 billion to stay afloat. Then on June 1st, GM released their financial statements and we realized just how screwed as a company they were. The government lent GM $30 billion to fund operations through June and July while it went through bankruptcy reorganization. Now this involved purchasing so much GM stock that the American federal government now owned 60% of the company, the Canadian national government now owned 12% of the company, and the Union Health Trust now owned 17% of the company. Apparently, private investors just weren't clamoring to invest in a company currently filing for bankruptcy. Similarly, the US government also guaranteed all car warranties, allowed consumers to be able to deduct car purchases from their taxes, and provided 0% financing options for certain vehicles. 
It was a similar story with Chrysler, who were also requiring more loans than initially requested. You gotta read the fine print, Bush. There's always hidden fees with these car companies. In their case though, rather than being bought by the US government, they were acquired by the Italian company Fiat. In the end, every automobile company paid back the government loans in full. So how did the American government end up losing $10 billion? Well, the federal government really took a bath on our General Motors stocks when we started to sell them off in 2010. In hindsight though, most people argue that saving the auto industry as well as all the jobs associated with it for a little over half the funds that have been reallocated towards Trump border wall project was probably a good call. It was also a cheaper bailout than the $29 billion in grants alone that the airline industry just requested, so stick that in your baggage compartment. Lastly, it allowed the federal government to trojan horse in some corporate reforms, including $1 a year salaries for CEOs short term, CEOs selling corporate jets, and a new emphasis on fast tracking energy efficient cars. Now one final interesting contrast between 2008 and today is back then most of the trojan horse requirements for companies were related to corporate strategies, efficiency, and improving product quality. Today it's a lot more related to workers rights and healthcare. Why is that interesting? Well, in 2008 the United Auto Workers Union agreed to accept delayed contributions to a health trust fund for retirees. It also agreed to reduce payments to laid off workers. There does seem in today's conversation to be a fundamentally different tone than the one back then. The goal back then was to help the auto industry recover and subsequently help auto workers because they get to keep their jobs. In this case, it definitely feels like there's more of an assumption of the inevitable long term industrial recovery of these industries. If they can just balance their books through this coronavirus season, they'll be all good. So we can really gouge these companies on other reforms. So those are the major takeaways from the bailouts with all the information we currently know. I'll keep you updated, but until those updates come, thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons for helping me put out my videos and keeping me fed during this coronavirus season. If you want to support independent nonpartisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. Give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.